It's almost impossible to believe that such a place exists. A little Wales on a faraway continent, where the familiar and the exotic come together in a magical way. A rich blend of cultures, 150 years in the making. <laughs> How the Welsh came to be here and fought to preserve their language and culture is a truly inspiring story. My father was in Gales, yes. Yes. They taught me a lot. They mastered a desolate and hostile frontier armed with remarkable faith and endurance. It is our very own Wild West epic. I've been following in the footsteps of those intrepid pioneers, fulfilling a lifelong dream to visit Patagonia. And to see for myself this special corner of South America, with its unexpected reminders of rural Wales. 150 years ago, a group of Welsh people set sail and crossed the Atlantic in search of a new life in South America. They gambled everything on this great venture. And this story of daring and courage and enterprise still has the power to fire the imagination. It is quite simply one of the greatest adventures in the history of Wales. The date is Friday the 28th of July, 1865, and the crossing, in rather primitive conditions, has taken two months. The pioneers, around 160 of them, are about to set foot for the first time on the shores of Argentina. But what they discover here is not what they'd been promised. They landed on a barren shore with no reliable supply of fresh water. A small advance party was waiting for them, but they'd made scant preparation for the arrival. Local historian Fernando Coronato showed me the makeshift man-made hollows in the rock that may have been used as stores or even, he believes, as temporary shelters. Fernando, it's an amazing place, uh, you know, with an amazing view, really, of the bay, but these remains, why are they so significant? What are they? They're important because they are the remains of uh, the first uh, Welsh footstep in Patagonia. It's a mark of the hopes of uh, people who were, were searching for a new land to build a new life with freedom and, well, sun and fair weather. <laughs> yeah. Legend has it that the Welsh sheltered in these natural caves. That may or may not be so. But nonetheless, there is very clear evidence of their presence here. Still visible today are the marks they left as they dug out clay blocks in their first attempts at building. When you look at how primitive, how basic this is, yes. um, in the first month after they arrived, did they suffer a lot of hardship? I mean, what happened to the women and children? Uh, they were four babies died and uh, an adult person, Catherine Davis, is died too. Catherine Davis was from Llandrillo. She was 38. Her baby son had already died on that long voyage across the Atlantic. I'm just struck, Fernando, by the thought that although they had made some preparations, it wasn't enough, was it? Is it because people were simply too idealistic? and they wanted it to succeed, they hadn't really thought it through? Well, the propaganda was, uh, had been very strong in Wales, and the, the Patagonia uh, was uh, drawn to a fantastic region, and the reality is not that way. There's no easy way to say this, but 
those first settlers had been very badly misled. And here's the proof. It's a little booklet for prospective migrants written by Hugh Hughes in 1862. He would be part of that first wave. And in it, he describes splendid expanses of green forest, herds of animals, rich pastures, and the rainfall, he says, is as regular as it is in Wales. At best, the leaders of this venture were guilty of wishful thinking. The negatives ignored, the positives greatly exaggerated. There was a heavy price. Before long, this unforgiving terrain had claimed its first victim. David Williams was a cobbler from Aberystwyth. And on his first day ashore, he clambered up from the beach and started walking. He was looking for that fertile valley that he'd read about in the booklet. He was never seen again. And two years later, his remains were found at a place called Pantereskin, the Vale of Bones. And he was identified by his ring and his cobbler's thimble. So why venture to this back of beyond, which had resisted the efforts of all previous settlers? It was the idea of Michael D. Jones. This outlandish project began to form when Jones saw a problem that he felt was set to destroy the whales he loved. Welsh coal mining was attracting thousands of English speakers to South Wales, and Jones feared that the native language and culture would quickly disappear. He believed that the only way that Welshness could be preserved was by establishing a new Wales in one of the most remote places on Earth, where no other language or culture would ever dilute it. So when the Argentine government offered an isolated tract of land along the Chubut River, it seemed ideal and Jones set about persuading able Welsh-speaking people to give up everything for a new life in the wilderness. For Michael D. Jones, the departure of the Mimosa in 1865 with 153 people on board was the realization of a dream. This parched landscape of scrub and thorns couldn't be more different from the whales they'd left behind. But armed with remarkable faith and endurance, they pushed on 40 miles to their promised land. The river valley, where they hoped to build a new life. It really is no exaggeration to say that this is the life source of this part of Patagonia. This is the River Chubut. The River Kamoy, as the Welsh used to call it, flows for over 500 miles from the Andes in the west over to the Atlantic in the east. And the river has been an immense blessing, creating fertile land and sustaining life. But it's also been a bit of a curse at times, especially in the winter months, overflowing its banks and causing some pretty destructive flooding. Even though the settlers' first wooden homes were swept away, it seemed there was no alternative but to settle close to the river. The snows and rains that caused the flooding were falling far away in the Andes and not on the parched and barren soil that formed the greater part of the land that they'd been given. It is difficult today to get a real sense of the extreme suffering and hardship of those first few years and there are some unsettling reports. In 1871, it was suggested that the Welsh had been reduced to eating grass in order to survive. Emergency supplies were sent by the Argentine government. The Royal Navy brought in British help. No wonder that one of the settlers loudly proclaimed, God save John Bull. There was mutiny in the air, and in 1867, most of the settlers were ready to abandon the venture, but they were persuaded to give the colony one last chance. And then came one vital innovation that changed everything. And without it, 
the modern state of Chubut in Argentina might simply not exist. In a dazzling feat of engineering, those early pioneers dug a network of irrigation canals across the valley and turned the desert green. The Welsh have certainly left their mark on Patagonia and made an enormous contribution. But there is no contribution greater than this one, bringing a supply of water over many miles into the middle of this barren land and transforming it into a fertile plain. And today's farmers are still benefiting from that Welsh achievement. Near his small farm in the Chubut Valley, Benito Jones showed me how much this breakthrough means. He still speaks the language that his forefathers came here to protect. And though the accent is different, it is still reassuringly familiar. Mae'n rhyfedd gweld gymaint o ddŵr, mae Benito, ond i wedi disgwyl gweld, falle nentydd mae cil, ond mae'n a lot o ddŵr ac mae'n llifo'n gryf. Ydy, mae'r ddŵr yn dod o bell. Mae'r ffosydd yn cymryd o ddŵr o'r afon yn lled â ni'n galw cig y ffos. Mae hwnna'n rhyw 60 o kilometros. Mae'n rhyfeddol ag wedi gwir. Y pellter sy'n yn haro hir, os chi'n sôn am fege o kilometrau, mae'r gwaith a chymryd ni hwn yn anferthol. Well, I think we have to do a lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of work. And what do you do? What do you do? Well, I think we have to do a lot of work. We have to do a lot of work, but we don't have to do a lot of work. But the work is very difficult. If we have to do a lot of work, we have to do a lot of work. But I don't think it's a lot of work. It's only from space that you can really grasp what was achieved here. A vast green strip surrounded by semi-desert. The same irrigation system that made agriculture possible here still sustains Aldwin Brunt farming in much the same way as his ancestors. His home is something of a time capsule, full of relics paying homage to the colony's founding fathers. So, I'm going to leave and get into it. So, pwy si yma? Gwyd o chi ddau, pwy si yma? Rhen ni gyn dwi'n gwybod i hen brant, Benjamin Brant oedd hwn. So, Benjamin Brant yw'r hen dai di chi? Ie, hen dai di chi. Fe oedd y brant cyntaf i ddod yma? Ie, bo, rhen ni gyn brant doth. Right. Rhen ni gyn brant. There's even a first-hand account of those pioneering days, a memoir written by Benjamin Brant in old age. A braf yw cael y teimlad o fod yn perchen ein tîr ein hunen. Yeah, tir na fi neb arall yn ei drin ond yw. Wrth gerdded o gwmpas fy'n hir yma, gallaf ganu fi yw brenin ar bopeth a wylaf, ac nid oes neb allu cymryd oedd i arnaf. Ni yw bod yn perchen tir un yna. Bod yn ddim yn rentir agor. Mae hwn yn ddiddorol hefyd fy'n hyn. Costiodd yn galed i mi am cymdogion dros flynyddoedd maith o waith caled a dioddef i droi'r lle yn ffrwythlon fel gardd. Ond caflawer o bleser yn fy hynaint wrth feddwl i mi weithio'n onest a di gwyn i wneud fy ran innau yn y fenter. Within just one decade, Benjamin Brunt was winning prizes in the US and in France for the quality of his wheat and his barley. But it took many years for those farms to prosper, and the Welsh colony might not have survived those early days without the help of the indigenous people, the nomadic Tewelche Indians, who traded with them and taught them to hunt for food. By and large, it was a remarkably peaceful coexistence. But it is ironic that the Welsh, in their search for a haven from discrimination at home, were now taking land from an oppressed minority on another continent.
we should add a note of caution about this bond between the Welsh and the native peoples. There's been a tendency to draw a rather sentimental picture about it. For a start, the Argentine government paid the native peoples not to attack the Welsh and to allow them to settle. There was plenty of trade between the two communities. The Welsh bartered things like bread and butter and sugar and got rather more valuable things in return, such as animal skins and blankets and ostrich feathers. And there are plenty of suggestions of questionable Welsh behaviour, such as buying horses with a few loaves of bread and selling alcohol to the native peoples. And that is something that caused untold misery, as it had done in the American West. Crossing this vast landscape today, you find very few traces of the Tewelcha Indians. They were dealt a crushing blow in the 1880s, when Argentine troops carried out a campaign to kill the indigenous people and seize their lands. To their credit, the Welsh often intervened. But it's no wonder that this genocidal campaign provoked attacks on white settlers. In March of 1884, a party of four young Welshmen were cornered at this very remote spot by a group of native Indians. We don't know why. Had the Indians been provoked in some way? We can't be sure. What we do know is that three of the Welshmen were killed in rather brutal circumstances. One of them, John Daniel Evans, made a rather miraculous escape. He had a detailed knowledge of the Indian trails in these parts, and in a tale that's passed into legend, his horse Malakara carried him away to safety and saved his life. This is the memorial installed by the Welsh to remember the three who lost their lives in that dreadful incident. And when they gathered here to mark the event, they sang a simple Welsh hymn. <laughs> Within a year, that sole survivor, John Daniel Evans, would play a pivotal role in the next chapter of the colony's history. He was the pathfinder for a band of explorers, most of them Welshmen, on a mission to open up the far west of Patagonia. The native people had long spoken of rich, fertile lands surrounded by snow-capped peaks. With no room to expand in the Chubut Valley, more farmland was needed to attract new immigrants from Wales. The adventurers were known as the Rifleros, or Riflemen of Chubut, and every year their descendants reenact their arrival. And what we have today is a taste, a hint of the pioneering spirit of 1885. These are today's rifleros. They're on their way to the top of the mountain to raise a banner to celebrate the discovery of this remarkable place. Those pioneers had crossed the plains for hundreds of miles and they got their first glimpse of this paradise, this fertile land, their new home. Cum Havrid, splendid valley. Then you never in the moon. Covia Marhai of Maganta and meal with country thick pimp. A quell of a new one in or caregma, quell of the fringe are tigavini. Oh, the mach is the friend Havrid. A cum Havrid or the Enuo ir Hamwea or Kumri. The Rifleros are very proud of their pedigree and their direct links to the founding fathers. Oscar Diochenbauer, lead I the Taili. Taili, we did not nine we we did not Port Madryn, Arimimosa, and we can't quite 
pimp. Ob miloch we pimp ar mimosa. Ar mimosa. Nein bi dat mam o dat bi. Al an sero nein in Hamri. In Kim in Chloe Coit Averdar. Chloe Coit Averdar. A pit at the Tilia ma i gum hyfryd. A gum hyfryd e wedi dod in Oes Cant now the gin. Miloch na win. Tilikent and dot vanin. Miloch na win. Ya. Ma in gum hyfryd iawn. Gum hyfryd. At last, here was the paradise that the Welsh had dreamed of. The rich soils of the valley floor were ideal to grow crops, and there was plenty of pasture on the surrounding slopes to raise livestock. And of course, cowboy culture came with the territory. This is Alejandro Jones, and he farms in the traditional way on land pioneered by his great-grandfather. He combines pride in his Welsh heritage with a love for the rugged Argentine way of life in the great outdoors. Ar hyn sydd ddiddorol yw bod ti'n cyfuno dau draddodiad ydw eu gwir, traddodiad yr ariannin a thraddodiad Cymraeg. Wel, ydw, mae'r uh, teulu ochr dad, y teulu sy'n sy, sy, sy bia'r ffarm yma, uh, o, o Lewy Jones yn, yn dod o, o Llanrwst. Uh, ac um, oedd o uh, wedi prynu'r ffarm yma, uh, mae, mae o wedi dod yn, yn, yn gawtio, Fel oedd y rhan mwyar ar y Cymro wedi wneud, ac oedd taid, y dau taid fi, hi'n bob ochr, taid Madrina, taid Wil, oedden nhw'n ddau yn gawtios, ond o'n gawtios go iawn. Uh, pan dwi'n meddwl am, am gawtio, pan dwi'n meddwl am ddysgu cyd, uh, pan dwi'n meddwl am dofi ceffyl, am, am gweithio fo'r gwartheg, dwi'n edrych uh, arnyn nhw. It is remarkable how the Welsh adapted to life on this wild frontier. And the clearest symbol of that is the asado, an outdoor roast where the whole animal is cooked on an open fire. The Green family invited me to taste the experience for myself at their home near Trevelin in Cwm Hyfryd. He can keep going? Well, my sister here. Now, keep going, come you. I'm going to meet. 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 The asado is a ritual that's enjoyed all over Argentina, the perfect occasion to get together with family and friends. But here there's one striking difference. As the conversation flows, the guests slip easily between Spanish and Welsh. The familiar and the exotic are combined in a rather special way by Vincent Evans. A Welsh folk song about a lovelorn maiden on the banks of the River Dee performed half a world away in the shadow of the Andes. <laughs> I think some viewers will wonder, why do you persist with this effort to speak Welsh? You can speak Spanish. Why do you make the effort? It's because we feel, we feel Welsh and um, something, um, I don't know. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Margaret? I carry, I, I love, I love um, the Welsh, the Welsh language. 
I love com I love Cumbria. <laughs> it's such an well. I can see that you know it's a very emotional thing. Yes, yes. it's a very emotional thing. Our grandparents came from Wales. The singing of Wales, um, traditional Songs. things from Wales, uh, the flag, uh, everything. It's part of you. Yes, yeah. because Welsh was my first language. That that that, that was the language my mummy uh, speak spoke to me. <laughs> yeah. The first days. At times like this, I have to pinch myself and realise that I am 7,000 miles away from Wales, enjoying some wonderful food and the best company. 40 years ago, I heard a teacher at Llangenech Primary School tell us about the wonders of Patagonia. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to come here, but I'm so glad that I have done. These people prove something rather special which is that it is perfectly natural to be proud, patriotic citizens of Argentina. It is also perfectly natural to be sustaining a Welsh culture and way of life. And I'm so pleased that I've been able to be part of that. Everywhere you look, the signs and symbols of Welshness sit comfortably in an Argentine setting, tokens of a shared heritage. But for the first settlers, there was one aspect of their culture that they were determined not to dilute or compromise. And this should provide a clue. This harmonium still plays a pretty decent hymn tune. Not bad considering it arrived here a century and a half ago with the Welsh pioneers. My name is Credi. Did you make it? I'm afraid I'm going to go to Mimosa and go to my Patagonia. A mi lwyth chwepim. Organ po yw hi yn wreiddiol. Drober Thomas o Fangor yn wreiddiol yn Gogledd Gymru. A wedyn, o Drober Thomas i dod yma? Wedi dod i Tlew, e bod Mary Thomas ar y long, mi mosa. A wedyn Mary Thomas si wedi cadw y ffarm hie. I chi'n amlwg yn edrych ar ôl yr offerin, pan bore mor bwysig i chi? Cerddariaeth hedi'r bwysig i'r bob o'r Cymraeg i Celtaidd hefyd. A gyda'r beibl, siŵr o fod yn cadw bobl cymru rai mwy agos teiliwyd yn y capel yn y ffarm ffermwyd wrth gwrs bob dydd sil a dydd sardw yn siŵr. Communal worship was a priority, even if it took place in a wooden hut. Such was the importance to the settlers of their non-conformist religion. Later, as they mastered their harsh environment, they built many more chapels. Some of those chapels are now dwarfed by urban sprawl. Others look much as they must have done when they were built. Relics of Victorian Wales transplanted to an alien landscape. We should never lose sight of the fact that for those early Welsh settlers, their faith, their non-conformist values were absolutely essential. That is what sustained them and helped them to get through all the trials and the difficulties that they suffered. And these chapels, however small and however modest they appear, were actually symbols of strength. This is Bethel Chapel in Trevelin in the Andes. The first meeting house the Welsh built here was a simple log cabin. Step inside and you could be in a chapel in rural Wales. Except that half the service is in Spanish. Bethel. 
Man Hebrid, Welde Kappel en Saun. Es hermoso ver la capilla llena. Bienvenidos a todos uh, a este lugar. Despite having no Welsh roots, the preacher, Isaias Grandis, learned the language after being inspired by the story of the Welsh pioneers. Panech yn sôn am gyfraniad y Cymru, a ddaeth yma fel arloeswyr, beth oedd pwysigrwydd crefydd iddyn nhw? Wel, y peth cyntaf o'n nhw'n neud, oedd adeilad i capel, felly oedd diwan y llyw cyntaf. A da chi dalu i clywed bobl sy'n dweud hynny, diwan cyntaf. A, a fel na, ma, maen nhw wedi gallu aros yma, a, a bi o'r caledu, a'r tlodi, a'r... A troi yr anialwch yna yn ffrwythlon, dwi'n mond efo di o'n nhw'n gallu. A mae'r llefrau swyddogol yw ladfan doedd hynny, achos ei ffydd naeth o'n waros. Their religion, bred and independent, and radical outlook, up to a point. Left alone for more than a decade to govern themselves, they created a society, unlike Britain, in which all men over the age of 18 had the vote. But crucially, the women were excluded. And it was here in the Chubut Valley that the institutions that upheld these values were founded, all run through the medium of Welsh. And here I am, I can hardly believe it, 40 years after I first had the dream of coming to Patagonia, I'm driving towards the Gaiman, which is one of the fortresses of Welshness in Patagonia. And it's a good time to think, with the sun setting here, about the ambition and the sacrifice and the vision of those settlers 150 years ago. It does make you feel very humble. In 1885, Gaiman became the seat of the first elected council in Patagonia. Gabriel Restuccia has been the town's mayor for the last eight years, the first Welsh speaker in the post since the 1950s. Pamor Vlingar oedd y Cymru yn gosod sefydliadau a threfn llywodraethol newydd. Oedden nhw ar flaen y gad? Ia, maen nhw... Maen nhw... Dwi'n siŵr pam daeth o'n nhw yma. Maen nhw'n gwybod beth i wneud. Maen nhw'n gwybod beth i wneud. A sydd i trefnu wlad, sydd i trefnu polis i newydd. Ac mae'r etifeddiaeth o'r cyngor cyntaf yna da ni wedi cael. Da ni nawr, da ni'n dymnyddio ar un polis i ddim, meddwl. The Welsh also took control of the economy, forming a cooperative company in 1885 that handled almost all local trade. And they built a railway linking the Chubut Valley to the coast, boosting exports and increasing prosperity. It meant that the arduous journey that cost the life of the Aberystwyth cobbler David Williams back in 1865 was now accomplished in a few hours. And their cultural confidence was expressed through the Eisteddfod, a celebration of all things Welsh. But success did attract some unwelcome attention. The Argentine government didn't see the Welsh community as an independent nation in its own right, but as an immigrant part of the Argentine population based in Chubut. By the 1890s, Welshmen had to take part in military drills on Sundays against their religious principles. There was a standoff. The Welsh appealed for British government help and considered relocating the entire colony to South Africa. In 1902, nearly 250 settlers did indeed turn their backs on Patagonia and resettled in Canada. Relations between the Argentines and the Welsh were damaged, and those left behind sought out a way to declare allegiance to their hosts. I'm riding on the old Patagonian Express on a route which skirts the border with Chile. At the turn of the 20th century, the frontier line was bitterly contested, with Chile claiming lands where the Welsh had settled. 
1902, the settlers were given a choice. Did they want to be Argentines or Chileans? And when they gathered here to vote, they opted decisively for Argentina. No one should be surprised by the result of the vote that took place at this school. Just imagine a different outcome. You'd have the Welsh community in Patagonia split. One part here in the Andes, in Chile. And then the other part, 500 miles to the east in the Chubut Valley, in Argentina. So this was a very significant milestone. The Welsh in Patagonia had declared themselves to be Argentine citizens. And to this day, they are considered to be Argentine heroes for the choice they made. The display of allegiance healed the rift between the Welsh and the Argentines, but the Welsh were not ready to integrate. Forty years earlier, the colony had been founded to prevent the culture and language being overwhelmed by those of England and to ensure that it was handed on to the generations to come. Now, with a new culture threatening to overwhelm them, the colony remained faithful to that original vision. They built a school, one that has a fair claim to be the first Welsh medium secondary school in the world. Wales would wait another 50 years. When the government opened... Some of Lined Gonzalez's family members were pupils here in the early days. Um, the school um, received pupils from all Patagonia at the beginning from the south and from the west and uh, in Gaiman itself, uh, children who were not of Welsh extraction attended the school. But the Argentine government saw no place for Welsh in education. State schools fostered patriotism and national unity under one language, Spanish. They offered something the Welsh school could not, official certificates and entry to university, so inevitably they drew pupils away. How did the policy of the central government in Buenos Aires affect the status and the teaching of Welsh? Well, the effect of that was that Welsh uh, was taught at the Band of Hope and at the chapels, uh, and uh, at the Sunday school, really. The Sunday school did a tremendous job to keep alive the Welsh language. In the early years of the 20th century, the Welsh community was no longer in secure isolation. The incomers were routinely in contact with people outside their own community. One day, Shui Dapiwan, the community leader and son of the founder Michael D. Jones, was out on the plane when he got into an argument with two strangers. Guns were fired and Jones fell to the ground. His murder near this spot in 1909 was a very big blow to the Welsh cause in Patagonia. He was shot dead by two men, two outlaws, at the Welsh cooperative store here at Nanta Pescod in the foothills of the Andes. And for many years, there were rumors that he'd been killed by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They'd been on the run here, but in fact, they had died the previous year. The men who'd shot him were called William Wilson and Robert Evans. They were former members of the Butch and Sundance gang. It was a reminder that the Welsh couldn't stay insulated from the outside world. They were fast becoming outnumbered by immigrants from Spain, Portugal and Italy, while the flow of new Welsh immigrants had dried up. So it was inevitable that the Welsh lost their political and economic power. By the 1920s, the co-op, the backbone of Patagonian business, was in trouble and went bankrupt in the Great Depression. The nationalisation of the Welsh-owned irrigation company in the 1940s was another blow. And the Eisteddfod, for so long the centrepiece of the Welsh cultural calendar in Patagonia, came to an end in the early 1950s. The Welsh became second-class citizens. Children were mocked in school as Pani Manteca, or bread and butter Welsh. For some, it became a badge of shame. 
Many families in the Chibut Valley have thoroughly Welsh names, but they're of a generation that was lost to the language. Me llamo Derwell Finlay Davis. Mis padres eran galeses, sí. Mi madre y mi padre, sí. Sí. Nine era Rachel Finch y Tate David Davis. Sí. But his parents decided not to pass on the language. Cuando yo era chico no se hablaba galés acá. Habían vecinos que eran de otras nacionalidades, así que bueno, andaban de visita o viéndose en el trabajo, así que nosotros el galés no se hablaba. A veces he pasado vergüenza por no saber. Estoy muy orgulloso de ser descendiente de los galeses, sí. 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 Me enseñaron mucho. Michael D. Jones had dreamt of creating a safe haven for Welsh culture. By the 1950s, the mission the founding fathers had sacrificed so much to achieve appeared doomed to failure. The survival of the language was at the very heart of that vision. By turning their backs on the language, it seemed a new generation of Welsh Patagonians were also rejecting the very identity that their ancestors had fought so hard to protect. Some films made by the BBC in the early 1960s strike a rather sad note. Where some of the old leaders lie buried, the pampas grass comes creeping back. Today, about 5,000 people of Welsh descent live in Patagonia. Slowly, they merge with the rest of the Argentine. Their language is dying. But the Welsh opened up Patagonia. We invited some of the people who took part in those films to view them again half a century on. By the 1960s, most chapel services were in Spanish, even if the congregation was Welsh. But Monu Evans de Hughes was fighting against the rising tide of all things Spanish. Well, Monu's daughter Donna was only three years old when the documentary was filmed. Geraint Edmonds belonged to a generation with an increasingly blurred sense of identity. Well, 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 it seems appropriate then that I should be chatting to Geraint in Welsh in a typical Argentine saloon bar. Gracias. Geraint, can I get you to go in the car? I didn't dare to go to the car, but I didn't dare to go to the car. Well, I didn't dare to go to the car. I didn't dare to go to the car. And I the Pobol and Day be the Kamarai Mem Pim Day Mlanad Wedimar. Well, all the Digan Rasamali Day than Yam Sarani. And that could have been the end of the story, but it isn't quite true.
1965, the colony celebrated its centenary, which brought attention, money and a revived interest in the vision of the founding fathers. Monuments like this one near the shore where the pioneers landed were built to celebrate their achievement. And all this awoke an awareness of the debt owed to the founding fathers and a new determination to keep their dream alive. And then a major turning point came at the beginning of the 1980s. Still without bootlaces, they were marched off and up the muddy track. The Falklands War brought defeat for the military regime and the start of a new democratic era. Argentine nationalism gave way to an emphasis on diversity and a new interest in learning Welsh. Thanks to teachers and funding from Wales, there are some 1,200 learners in Patagonia. I went to the language centre in Esquel in the Andes to meet some of them. What I found striking was that few of the learners had obvious Welsh links. I spoke to Claire Vaughan, the Welsh language project coordinator. What do you think accounts for the surge in interest that you're seeing? There's been a growing awareness here, I think, of uh, bilingualism as something good. Uh, I think in the, back in the Dark Ages, it was felt that if you spoke two languages, it was a bad thing. I think now we've moved on from that, and there's an acceptance that actually it's very good for you to have more than one language. So, so that in general has helped the cause. And I also think there's more acceptance of um, different routes. People in, in Argentina are becoming more interested in where they've come from, so I think that helps. And also, we've got people who come in from the big cities who are looking for a better life here. And what they love about communities like Trevelin, Escal, is that uh, they have a different identity because of the Welsh connection, and so they want to learn the language. The Welsh identity that Michael D. Jones fought to preserve has been revived in a way that he couldn't possibly have imagined. Most of these folk dancers have no Welsh roots at all. Virginia Steinkamp is an Argentine of German descent. I met her to try and find out why she was so keen to embrace all things Welsh. Running very high, clear water in the ice in the chapel, head bubble and shara, that can carry, running running hoffy, shower, running yard course in the in the ice. Not for mum and me, but for the camrack. Like many others, I have fond memories of the chapel tea where people would spend hours sharing stories and gossiping. It's a tradition that has dwindled in Wales, but it's still going strong here in Patagonia. At these regular get-togethers, Spanish is left at the door. People relax, eat and talk in Welsh. In Gaiman, if you want to experience a bit of Welshness, it seems you'd better like tea. There's a Welsh tea house on every corner, each vying to be more Welsh than the next. The sign here reads, the first Welsh tea house in Patagonia. And one in particular attracts tourists by the busload. Besides the outsized Welsh teapot, its big selling point is that Diana, Princess of Wales, stopped here for a cuppa in 1995. It seems nothing tops that for Welshness. So they preserved and washed the plate she used, the teapot her tea was served from, and the cup she drank from. The dregs are stored in a little bottle. Muy bien. Gracias a usted. 
very good, a nice cup of tea. And this for you, in many ways, is the value of Welshness in Patagonia today. I'm talking about commercial value, and there's a strong royal flavour to that commercial activity. All of this is held together by this notion of a traditional Welsh tea, a kind of chapel tea, if you like, though it's much more sumptuous than the chapel teas I remember as a boy. And all of this is underlined by the fact that the family running this place admit very happily that they have little or no connection with Wales or Welshness. They are just running a very successful business. And that's the thing. Welshness does sell. And things that make money are very interesting to politicians and business people alike. The Eisteddfod, revived in 1965 as a bilingual event, is now used to sell the area to tourists. And the provincial government has helped to pay for renovations to the Welsh chapels and markets them as historic visitor attractions. If I had any doubt about the place of Wales in modern Patagonia, well, that doubt vanished when I ran into a parade celebrating the foundation of the town of Trevelin. It's revealing because it shows you how the province sees itself. The indigenous Indians are represented, as are the Hispanic peoples and the Arab immigrants too. But pride of place goes to the Welsh contingent for their crucial role as founders of the settlement back in the 1880s. The man applauding is Martin Bussi, the Argentine governor of Chubut province. To discuss the Welsh influences that surround him, I went to see the governor in the state capital, Rousson. And just inside the door, dominating the foyer, was something rather significant a mural depicting the Welsh-Argentine cooperation. It became clear that marking the 150th anniversary was a political priority. Porque esa, eso que comenzó siendo una colonia con 153 eh, inmigrantes en un barco, en pocos años eh, tenía ferrocarril, en pocos años había eh, domado al río, en pocos años había hecho sistemas de riego. La llegada de los galeses es fundante de la ocupación del espacio patagónico. The change in the status of Welsh since the 1960s is quite marked. In 2006, exactly a century after the first Welsh language school opened, the community proudly opened a new bilingual primary school. One of the teachers there is Catrin Morris. Ernestina? <laughs> Planeta Tenol, Aes Cambri, Isabetli Ulada Patagonia. We've come a very long way. We've come a very long way. There is a renaissance of interest in the Welsh, the Welsh language, the Welsh culture, and the Welsh people. It's notable that many of the children here have no Welsh at home and no Welsh ancestry. More than that, only the Spanish part of their education is free. Their parents have to stump up extra for the Welsh half, and it seems they're perfectly happy to do so. We offer an education that nobody else here in Trelaw and Chibut offers at the moment. We offer an education that is based on family values and um, values based on respect. And we offer bilingual education, which is proven to give great advantages. (laughs) 
at the cemetery where many of the founding fathers were laid to rest, you do wonder what they would make of Patagonia today. Would they recoil at the sight of the colony they built becoming a tourist commodity in the global marketplace? Or would they be heartened that the Welsh identity is being constructed and claimed in new ways? The Founding Fathers had set out to build a new Wales, marked above all by cultural purity. That vision fell short in many ways, but it is remarkable that 150 years later, their descendants are still fighting for the language and culture that they came to protect. I remember the funeral in the 60s and the preacher said, I hear another nail in the coffin of the Welsh language. We are speaking of the 60s and we still speak Welsh here. People from outside come in and see it as something interesting. As long as we've got young people in the classes, I'm totally convinced that uh, the thing is going to grow and grow. Dynani, dynia ma. Look, wait a power for the dynia ma hit. 